Teammates, 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 we are back once again. If this is your first time listening to the Move Swiftly podcast, welcome to the show. Welcome to the number one show on innovative teamwork. To my regular listeners, you already know how it gets down. You know what it's all about when you hit that play button. Nothing but incredible moments, incredible people, incredible messages, incredible stories to give you to just make it, make it so you get through your moment. Today, coming straight out of the UK of all places, Miss Tara Holiday, who's getting ready to give us a master class on imposter syndrome. So all that being said, Tara, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Aswan. It's great to be here. Really excited to talk about this, actually. I am. I mean, you're excited. Yeah. I'm excited. As a former athlete, someone former athlete and coach scout has been in the sports world. Now is kind of in the in the education and the business world. We see it all the time. It's copycat syndrome. Everybody wants to be like somebody else. And in many ways, sometimes it can be beneficial to you. But this concept of imposter syndrome, now there's certain points of it where it can actually be a detriment. So I'd love to just start off by just getting your get an overall perspective or definition of what imposter syndrome is and how you're able to navigate and help people with it. I'll just kind of give you an open slate now and, and run with it. So go and do your thing. All right, great. So imposter syndrome is the secret feeling of being a fraud, not good enough, when you are good enough, right? So it's it's a false illusion that you're not good enough. So yeah. it, it hits su successful people mm -hmm. and it affects over 70% of high achievers, which is, yeah. which is an awful lot of people. This is why people keep it a secret. They don't talk about mm -hmm. it because they think it's just them. And so the, the, the idea then perpetuates. And, and really the problem with imposter syndrome is it gets in the way of you achieving your best, achieving what you want to do. It changes the way that you think even um, on, a, on a physiological level. And we can get into that. So yeah. what we need to do is to change the root cause of imposter syndrome. So there are symptoms that people see and yeah. there's, the, there's the root cause. And treating the symptom is not enough have to treat the root cause right and I'm, well, I'm glad you clarified that uh, for the listeners and for myself as well because I think it is important to understand that there are symptoms and the root causes is something that it takes a little it takes a, a little more digging but when it comes to the symptoms I would do want to get your thoughts on when you see it being something productive though when you see it like where's the difference between me wanting like I, again i'm a football guy i used to look up to ray lewis i wanted to be the best nfl linebacker and stuff like so it was making it so i worked out a lot making it so i stayed away from alcohol and drugs and and all the other yeah. things that could have gotten me in the way so it's being productive but it gets to a point like you said whereas now you got to accept the fact look i'm not going to be as good as ray lewis that doesn't mean i just go and do things wrong can you what kind of navigate and walk us through how you say, okay, there's some good parts about imposter syndrome, but here's the signs for the listeners to say, hey, okay, now we got to figure out how to get into the root cause and navigate that space a little bit. Right. Okay. Well, so uh, in terms of the actual symptoms, one of the, the one that you're talking about now is a very, very common one, comparing Mm -hmm. where you're comparing yourself to other people and you're feeling that they're so much better than you and that you're therefore not good enough. Mm -hmm. um, and although that's a symptom of imposter syndrome, um, it's not, I wouldn't say that any of the symptoms of imposter syndrome are, are, are happy, uh, helpful. So, mm -hmm. the, um, so, but the comparing, I can see what you, you mean in terms sure. of if you compare to someone for inspiration. Yeah, like an inspiration. Right? Like you said, look, I will, I will copy this guy's method. I will do yeah, all the I will, things. Yeah, I will he... run like, I mean, everything. I used to wear his jersey underneath my pads. I used to like every like he used to take a deck of cards, do as many push-ups. You know, again, these are things that are actually going to be beneficial and productive. But yeah. what I would kind of go back and tell my younger self is like because as one was willing to do those things, I'm giving Ray Lewis too much credit for doing these things. But at the end of the day. I, you know, I know I saw him do it. So it made me want to be productive. And, and that's really what I want to get out because I agree with you to the point where you're right. It isn't as helpful as you thought it was, but there are yeah. parts of it where at least it puts you kind of in the, in the right track or the right state of yeah. mind. So yeah, exactly. So, so the, so the good comparing is when you're getting inspiration mm -hmm. where it motivates you, where it gets you to do something and gets you to 
stretch when you maybe are a bit tired, you know, put, yeah, yeah. Go, that, they'll go that extra mile, right? All right. of that, mm -hmm. that's positive. The negative part of comparing is where you uh, look at your colleagues and peers, and that's whether it's in sports or business, and mm -hmm. think they are so much better at this. I'm not good enough. And mm. therefore, and you start judging yourself and criticizing yourself. Now, mm. that's where it turns into right. uh, a very unhelpful thing, because if you're judging yourself, you're criticizing yourself. Mm -hmm. That then changes your your physiology. Right mm. now, this is this is fascinating. When you have this kind of strong self doubt, self criticism, self judgment, you're mm. thinking that you just got lucky, which is a lot of what imposter syndrome um, is about. Um, that triggers your nervous system and your nervous system goes from being you know calm and productive to mm -hmm. it goes into emergency mode it goes into danger mode it goes it puts you into fight flight or freeze states and nervous system states mm. totally appropriate if there's a tiger in the room and you've got to bite yeah. your way out or run oh, away or something like that yeah. right? this is your natural physiological reaction to mm. danger and it's so it's it, there's nothing wrong with it However, mm -hmm. there is no danger here. And what it does is it changes the blood flow in your body. So mm -hmm. it changes the um, blood flow to your mu large muscle groups to allow you to fight or run away. Mm -hmm. And it takes that blood, because it's got to come from somewhere, from right. your digestive system, as, as, as many people know, but also from a part of the brain called, called the prefrontal cortex, which is mm -hmm. just behind your forehead. And that's your logical thinking strategic planning part, part of the brain mm -hmm. and the problem with that is when you that doesn't get enough blood flow literally oxygen nutrients right you, you literally cannot think so well in mm -hmm. fact the princeton university did a study where they measured that people's iq dropped by 13 points mm -hmm. when they're in the flight flight and freeze state right. which is huge creativity goes down by 50 percent <laughs> mm -hmm. all, all your it, it makes you um, emotionally reactive so you're not as calm you don't make such good decisions as mm -hmm. a lot of negative performance consequences yeah. for, for the your nervous system it makes you anxious and overwhelmed and mm -hmm. then what happens is you start to do some coping behaviors unproductive behaviors so people become perfectionist they procrastinate or they procrastinate yeah, they they over Comparison can get you in trouble, right? And the comparison, and and so all, all of those are just ways that your that your system is trying to mm -hmm. to cope with that that stress. Right. And then, of course, because those behaviors are unproductive, and yeah. people judge themselves, and then so they're going around in this circle, right? Yeah. And that's that's the the symptom circle, and that's why it's so significant when you're talking about wanting to perform at your very best. Yeah it's 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 really holding you back and it's mm -hmm. and it's not even the way that you're thinking about it. it it goes a bit deeper than that as well yeah the and then also with the example i shared you could run into the concept or the idea the the aspect of trying to be a perfectionist because yes. of the, you're looking up to these people and you're seeing the finished product like i'm seeing ray lewis right. in the nfl i'm not seeing ray lewis when he was a little kid in middle school <laughs> high school, but he was going through in the rough times he was having i'm seeing the finished product and that can kind of mm -hmm. distort the view as well so you already kind of mentioned a little bit about take getting away from the root causes and stopping the root causes of it if there is right. any listening in now that is in a position to help people, whether it's a parent, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a coach or uncle on whatever the whoever the adult is, and they see this imposter syndrome symptoms. Well, first of all, can you explain what the root cause is? And then how can they go about getting away from the root cause? And I want to kind of paint paint a different example in your head as I give you this, because the first one I told you was about a positive one. I also have, you know, family members that drink and smoke and get high and weren't the best of husbands and things like that. And if I was trying to fit into that family mold, if that was the route I was going in, I could have yeah. spent my high school years smoking and drink and getting high, mm -hmm. and the mess of women abuser and all those things. And that would have been just say, hey, look, this is these are some of the members of my family. This is what they've done. Why wouldn't I do it? Right. But again, I was going with the football route, but I could have easily again, I have cousins, I have friends, I have people that have been in my life that easily took the other route and started 
with the unhealthy behaviors and then you saw it just spiral out of control. So I know I gave you a loaded question there, but please, you know what, because I, I tell you, I'm very, very interested in this topic. Walk us through, first of all, the symptoms, but how to get that stuff out of it. Because I see it all the time in younger kids that I teach now to yeah. figure out, hey man, that's just you trying to be like so-and-so. Let's figure out ways to get that stuff out of your system now. So anyway, the, the floor yeah. is- Yeah, oh, so I, I know you make a really, really good point about this what you're talking about is is normalizing in terms of your environment right yes. so you're talking about you know you grow up in a family and that's what's normal for you and it's only when you start to get a bit older and see other people's families that you realize oh maybe that's not <laughs> normal for everyone you just think it's normal for you and so you know there's there's definitely this idea in business that you know surround yourself with people that you want to be with be like and who embrace your values right mm -hmm. so your aspirational team to surround yourself with those people and that is normalizing it for them so mm -hmm. this is why um when you're working with like young athletes for example it's great to have them as a group so they normalize you know what yeah. or even what practice looks like for a team right that's it's not right, just right, one right. walk around the track right it's right. It's, a, it's a it's a lot more than that i'm sure it's not <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> yeah or well, we'd all be superstars right? right um so then in terms of what is the root cause of imposter syndrome mm -hmm. um it actually turns out that this is not down to our environment it is not down to it, trauma it's not down to poor parenting it's not down to any nasty event happening none of that yeah. and this was this, yeah. I had no I would have <laughs> assumed that that's exactly what it's about talk to us yeah Please yeah. yeah and 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 so this is one of the big myths and and this is why when people haven't had that you know my parents were fine why do I still feel this way it's so confusing yeah, yeah. um so this was actually research done way back in the 1950s, right? Mm -hmm. the, um, one of the grandfathers of personal psychology, Dr. Carl Rogers, right. he was looking for why do people suffer? Why, yeah. when they've got food and shelter and <laughs> clothing and jobs and, and money, yeah. why are they still miserable, right? Yeah. Why aren't we just, you know, happy with we're getting our basic needs met? And what he came down to, he found the answer, mm -hmm. was the, that we have a belief that our worth as a person depends on what we do, right? Where our worth and our actions are combined. The congruent, so right. So if you Parallel. do something, yeah, so if you do something good, you are good, right? If you mm -hmm. score that winning goal, right, you right. are good. Yeah. Yeah. If you do something bad <laughs> or mess up, yeah. then you are bad. And, and what it means is that life then becomes very, very unstable, right? Yeah. Because even when we're at the peak, at the top, they feel like, well, if I now make a mistake, mm -hmm. then I'm going to be bad again. My worth is going to go down again. Right. Or, you know, so... This is why this is why you see it showing up for successful people because it's the it's the worry that goes with it even when we're successful. This why this is why you can't out succeed imposter syndrome, right? You 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 can't you know the idea as well. You know when I get to the next level, yeah, then I'm not going to feel this way. I'm not going to feel this self doubt. I don't. I'm not going to feel like I don't belong. I'm gonna I'm gonna really yeah. appreciate my success and and. Yeah. This is why it doesn't happen. So that's the root cause of it. It's called conditional worth, depending on what you do. And that comes from a part of our development as a child, right? And, and it affects 99.999% of people in, across the globe, right? So it's not, it's not a cultural issue either. Right. And what's going, on, what's going on here is that when a baby is born, mm -hmm. right, they've got all the information coming in through all their senses, but they've got no structure for it. They've got no plant they don't understand things and then gradually as they grow and become a toddler they start to you know understand that that's the cat and <laughs> that's the table yeah, and that's hard it, personalities right it, they map it out yeah and, and and we start to learn to separate ourselves between the ages of 18 months and three years old we start to identify us as a separate person right mm -hmm. that, that realization comes there now at that point is the time that we should have learned to separate our worth 
from our actions. But mm. because culturally the whole of society doesn't do yeah. that, yeah. Mm. we don't learn it. Mm -hmm. And what it happens is that then events reinforce that, mm -hmm. right? And so you, you know, people remember certain teachers had this, or certain friends had that, and their parents had that, right? But that hasn't that wasn't what caused it. That's just reinforced it and yeah. told your brain it's true. Wow. <laughs> As, you know, when you get to high levels of success and you're still feeling that internal doubt it's because you're still believing this 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 missed step in development still believing it, 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 an outdated belief so that's the work that i do is change that belief very systematically using all sorts of neuroscience and that change that belief so that you understand that your worth is unconditional yeah, and it's it's making me think a lot because as you're talking, I'm going back to my childhood self. And when I made a great play on the football field, I did that. And, and, and it, as simple as it is, it's honestly just actions speak. We're defined by our actions. We're defined yes. actions of speaking louder than words. And these simple sayings turn out to be so true because, again, I was successful on the field because that's what I did. I wasn't going down the route of being an alcoholic or being one of these people that I could have easily been uh, running around the bit because I'm good at playing sports and that's what I did. Now your yeah. point about your parents or people that are around you reinforcing that, that is very true because again, I had two parent household and they were there. However, when I was not able to do it on the level of a Ray Lewis, that's when a lot of the problems started happening. That's when a lot of uh, disagreements and uh, just a lot of strife and there's this a lot of going back and forth with my parents and things like that the people that there was a lot of an awakening when it comes to that so uh, I'm curious now because you have a book on the subject and because you have been able to codify this you have clearly studied this to the point where I, I, I'm so happy to have you on and so happy that that listeners are getting a hold of this what do you do with your clients? What do you do with people that, you know, are coming to you, your, whether it's your students, the mentees, the people that want to dive deeper into your work? You know, walk us through the, the you kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, walk us through the processes in which you are taken to sort of heal them or put them on the path towards healing themselves from this syndrome. Because, man, I'm, I'm thinking like, man, there's a lot of people that, <laughs> that need it because it's so common to have the imposter syndrome and there's no one out there that at least to my knowledge that's actually out there weeding it out of people we're just reinforcing some of the things that they do well and we praise them for what they do well and we think we're okay we've done our job as an educator right you know so you know <laughs> yeah, speak to us speak to us yeah that that's it well you know what's interesting that imposter syndrome was first identified back in 1978 so 40 odd years ago hmm. and there's a paper research paper 78 1978 yes. yeah that's not even that far that's yeah it's just a couple of couple of years ago i was born 89 so i was like i was uh, still a kid basically you know you just discovered it yeah yeah and the, well they uh, they identified it obviously it's been yeah. there, around um there was a a, a research paper published in 2020 mm -hmm. uh that that looked at all the, the the research and they found that there were no tested like proven solutions to imposter syndrome by that point Mm. right 2020 so it's like 40 years of, of research people don't know what to do and my understanding to that is that they're they're going for the symptoms and not the root cause now there are four studies out there now mm -hmm. <laughs> which which have some help right. um and and what i'm going to tell you is the one that so far it's it's got the best results of all of them so i'm very mm. excited to share this with you yes yes so what we do yeah so what we do is uh it's a we work one to one mm -hmm. because this isn't and this because this isn't a mindset thing and it's not something you, you you know you can read my book outsmart imposter syndrome and you you'll you'll get the flavor for it mm -hmm. but the work is one to one we go quite deep because what we're going to do is we're going to change that belief that your worth is conditional and we're going to change it to your worth is unconditional Man. the first thing we do is we start with tools that allow you to get calm Right. I mentioned the fight, flight, and freeze state. As mm -hmm. soon as you're in that state, then you're not in your not at your best. You're not in your peak. You're not working at your best. Mm -hmm. So the very first thing we do is, is techniques to get your whole nervous system back to the calm state. Mm -hmm. And then we go to deeper levels of, of calm by identifying some of the um 
symptoms mm -hmm. and plans for what you can do about the symptoms and then identifying your trigger points and mm -hmm. plans for you know avoiding the the, the, the trigger points so that yeah so okay. don't don't run through the mud kind of thing <laughs> right. run around it yeah yeah all those right. so that's kind of like the foundation first to get calm when your nervous system is calm then we can do the the brain engineering if you like the changing mm -hmm. and then the next step is to to um is a, a way of viewing the world so you're not taking things personally Mm -hmm. Right. So we're talking about, you know, self-criticism, self-judgment. You know, you see someone get angry at you and mm -hmm. shout at you. Mm -hmm. There's a way that you can look at that and see that that's about them and yeah. what's going on for them. Yeah. So it's it's it puts you into an amazingly powerful, resourceful state because you're not then swept away by other people's mm -hmm. unhelpful stuff. <laughs> the stuff they didn't work out right. Because that's what yeah. they, they try to put their bullshit on you, right? Yeah, it, it, it's that we, we I mean, if you hear, if if you have someone saying, well, this is your fault, mm -hmm. right, then you, you tend to believe it. Exactly. When we see things as, you know, someone saying, this is your fault, as uh, them saying, I've had a really hard day and I'm really stressed out. And <laughs> yeah. When that, when you know that that's actually what it is, right? That's right. And that allows you to get calm and that allows you to start seeing people with compassion, mm -hmm. right? To understand that they're doing the best that they can with mm -hmm. the resources that they have at the time. And, and, and that, that really is, you know, something that, you know, anybody in their position with their experiences would do the same, right? So you start to see mm -hmm. other people's worth as being unconditional, Rather right. than blaming them, making them bad for what they do. Mm -hmm. And then you go through another level where you do that for yourself. Right. Spend a bit more time just reinforcing that, deepening that, and then adding in, um, you know, the extras like um, aligning authenticity. Because when, when you change that worth belief, then you can get to your values more easily, more quickly, and... Um, and 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 really operate from them uh in in an effortless way so what sort of pushback do you get because as you just mentioned you're teaching people that their condition their condition isn't going to be value to their worth that's going to be unconditional right yet i i can yeah. think of so many relationships that were based on a condition like oh you got to make this amount you got to do this you got to look like this and all of a sudden they're together mm -hmm. I could see so many of that kind of being broken up the minute they start to realize, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be loved unconditionally, not based on a condition. So speak to that a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, this is why imposter syndrome is not just about performance, athletic performance and work, right? Mm -hmm. it, it ripples out and it has this yeah. impact yeah. because it's based on this effect. conditional right. work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what I see is that, um, people are able to communicate much better mm -hmm. because they're not yes. being reactive about being blamed. They, they see the other person as doing the best they can. They held them in compassion. They're right. not, they're not, you know, responding. If someone's shouting, you, you're not getting into a fight, right. which calms the other person down. Mm -hmm. So I've seen people come back from the brink of divorce <laughs> yeah, yeah because you're right years of it it's going to lead to that divorce but eventually if you realize and yeah. these are just small switches in the mind they come back yeah. That's, yeah, exactly exactly That's it. Glad you brought so that I, it's 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 absolutely brilliant so uh, you know people are able to to talk more clearly about themselves because mm -hmm. they're not stressed because they can keep calm and they can they can keep compassionate and they can have that both of us are unconditionally worthy conversation. It's just amazing. Um, people have more time for their children. Mm -hmm. They, um, you know, they're able to switch off at night because they're not stressed because they're not going around, to, round and round in this loop of the, the imposter syndrome th symptoms, the worry, the stress of it, mm -hmm. the replaying things in your head over and over, all of that. So they've got more time for their kids, more patience, they're more present and, it's it's just uh, amazing they, they they then start to be from that point you're able to teach your children that your worth is not what you do 
Yes. And, and that, that is a, the, the, like life is a race to get there because we live in this society that's conditioned, uh, conditioning us to do the opposite where we're praising and we just want to, we're not realizing how much it is actually affecting our young people. So, you know, again, I yeah. do want to be very respectful of your time, Tara. Can you just, you know, tell people what's next if they want to work with you and, you know, your business, how you plan on serving people and, you know, what's the best way to get in touch with you if they want to hear more. So I'll let you kind of take it away from there. Yeah. So what I've got going on right now is is a bit of a, I, I mentioned the research projects, you know, the, the four different ones. Well, I'm just embarking on a new research program. So I've actually closed the doors on my one-to-one -one work temporarily. Okay. I'm running a research program. I'm training up because there's a question, you know, I've been I've been running this this program a lot and it's getting fantastic results. Mm -hmm. And in my paper that I've written, one of the reviewers said, well, um, is it is it just therapist effect they call it right is it me is it somehow just right. because i'm such a brilliant coach and the answer no it's right. a very systematic process yeah, yeah, so yeah. what i'm doing is i'm i'm training up a bunch of experienced executive coaches so yeah. first they go through my program in in, um, in a, a a week tra a one week intensive training mm -hmm. and then um and then i supervise them and i teach them how to deliver and then mm -hmm. they have three case study clients each and they deliver. So I supervise them delivering it. And what we're doing is we're proving on a much larger scale mm -hmm. that this isn't all down to me. Right. So we're repeating the results with, with a lot of different facilitators, if you like. So this is my big research program. Um, I'm doing it as close to free as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a super it's a super low cost. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would be looking for anyone who is over 33 years of age mm -hmm. and is a leader, entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you know, leadership management, anything like that. Mm -hmm. And they get to be case study clients for us one to one. We'll be starting this off uh, in October. So I'll give you a link. <laughs> and that's I, I fit that description you just <laughs> and that's actually no that's actually going to be around the time this episode is going to be released so hey you just say you say the word man i will i'll share that Fantastic. i'll be part of it if i can uh, i think that's yeah. incredible uh, like i said you could probably tell just based on the interview that i'm personally so interested in this type of work especially if you're talking about how it's affecting our businesses and affecting the way our young people are seeing the world. So what is uh how do people get in touch with you just to, to kind of put it out there? Is it a website or, you know? Yeah, website is outsmartimpostorsyndrome.com. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's a link to the research study right there on the front page. And I, I'll give you the, I'll give you a couple of other links as well. Absolutely. And all that will be included, in, excuse me, all that will be included in the show notes as well. So all that being said, Tara, the way I close out all the shows is I want you to use your imagination a little bit. I want going to kind of put you on the line. Now. I, want to, I want you to go back to a time in your life where you were dealing with the imposter syndrome and you were that person. You were kind of a victim of the kinds of things that you are helping with now. Go back to that young Tara, uh, give her some words of encouragement and we'll officially close. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I love it. So my first experience with imposter syndrome was I'd just come out of university. Mm -hmm. I applied for a job with this big, you know, global electrical company mm -hmm. and um, as a graduate trainee. And they sent, sent a message back. They said, we've done our psychological testing. Um, we don't want to offer you a graduate tr trainee position. We want to we want to put you on a super fast track management position. To which I said, oh, no. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That was my imposter syndrome, my feeling that I could that I could not deliver that, that, that their expectations of me were were too high and, mm -hmm. and, and that that leadership was a, um, a talent, not a skill. Mm -hmm. right? that was, uh, and I can see it now. Right. Yeah, so if that yeah, if I go that. back to Tara, yeah, then yeah, I'm picturing her here. Right? <laughs> sit down and I, I say look you, you know you know leadership you know it's a skill and they can teach you and they're offering you to put you on this track and they will teach you and coach you and mentor you the whole way through mm -hmm. and you will do great that would have changed my life because I um, I went right the way I, I actually ran away I ran away back to university and uh, I and I went and did my PhD because um, that was my 
comfort zone. Now, there's nothing wrong with the PhD. Yeah, I, I, I hate no, it. No, but... but I mean, when you think about what it could have been and just that one piece of advice. And the reason I do close out the shows like that is because anybody listening in that's facing that dilemma or in, maybe in that situation, we're here for you. I mean, the people I bring on, whether it's just myself or a guest, we're here to get you through the moment, like I said at the beginning. And if that describes your situation, just know there will be people there to mentor you along the way, even if it's not within your company, there's resources out there like Tara, like myself, that can create opportunities for you. So all that being said, fellow teammates, continue to move swiftly. We will talk more soon.